So, Polycharmus began his story. We, the two prisoners, are Syracusans. The other young man was once preeminent in Sicily, in rank and wealth and appearance. As for me, I am of no consequence, but I am his companion and friend. Well, we left our parents and sailed away from Syracuse. I went for his sake, he because of his wife, Calerho. He thought she was dead and had given her a costly funeral, but tomb robbers found her alive and sold her in Ionia. We got this information from the pirate Theron when he was publicly questioned under torture. So Syracuse sent a Tremi and a delegation to look for the woman. This ship was set on fire by barbarians at night as it lay at anchor. They killed most of us, but made prisoners of me and my friend, and sold us to your estate. Now we put up with our misfortune patiently, but some of our fellow prisoners, whom we do not know, broke their chains and committed a murder, and you ordered us all to be taken off and crucified. Well, my friend didn't utter a word against his wife, even when the execution was underway, but I was moved to speak her name and call her the cause of our troubles, because she was the reason we sailed. Before he had finished, Mithridates cried, Is it Charius you mean? He is my friend, said Polycharmus. Please, sir, tell the executioner not to separate even our crosses. This story was greeted with tears and groans, and Mithridates sent everybody off to reach Charius before he died. They found the rest nailed up on their crosses. Charius was just ascending his, so they shouted to them from far off. Spare him, cried some. Others, come down, or don't hurt him, or let him go. So the executioner checked his gesture, and Charius climbed down from his cross with sorrow in his heart, for he was glad to be leaving a life of misery and ill-starred love. He was being brought. Mithridates met him and embraced him. My brother, my friend, he said, your silence almost misled me into committing a crime. Your self-control was quite out of place. Straight away, he told his servants to take them to the baths and see to their physical well-being. And when they had bathed, to give them luxurious Greek clothes to wear. He, invite, he himself invited men of rank to a banquet and offered sacrifice for Chariot's rescue. They drank deep, and there was generous hospitality and cheerful rejoicing. As the feasting went on, Mithridates became heated with wine and passion. Charis, he said, it is not your chains and your cross that I pity for you. It is losing such a wife. Charis was thunderstruck. But where have you seen my Calerho? he cried. She is not yours any more, said Mithridates. She belongs to Dionysius of Miletus. She is his legally married wife, and now they have a child as well. When he heard that, Charius could not endure it. He fell at Mithridates' feet. Sir, he cried, I implore you, put me back on the cross. It is worse torture to force me to live after such news. Faithless Calerho, wickedest of all women, I have been sold into slavery on account of you. I have dug the earth. I have carried my cross. I have been handed over to the executioner. And you were living in luxury. You were celebrating your marriage while I was in chains. And you were not satisfied to become another man's wife while Charius was still alive. You became a mother, too. Everyone began to weep. The banquet became a scene of gloom. Mithridates alone was pleased at this. It gave him some hope in his passionate love, since he could now talk and take some action about Calerho, ostensibly to help a friend. Well, he said, it is night now and time to break up. We can think about all this tomorrow when we are sober. It needs time to look into. With that, he rose and brought an end to the banquet. He himself retired as usual. As for the young Syracusans, he gave them their own room and servants to look after them.